Hello, I'm your host, Chris Cappy. I'm an incredibly average US Army Iraq War veteran. It's my goal with this channel to bring my very casual level of insight into how the military operates. Today's episode is about the military raid on an objective, also known as urban operations. Door kicking is the skill craft for grunts. It's important to realize just how far Mount has evolved over the past few decades. The military has gone from the old school World War II strategy of opening up a door and tossing in a grenade to our modern, more sophisticated way of kicking in a door and surgically clearing the room of only the hostile threats. The room clearing tactics that the US infantry use are also the same exact methods adopted by most Western countries, but many military trainers are starting to cast doubt on whether the US version is the best way to clear rooms. The British methodical room clearing version might be better. We'll get into that all a little bit later. Let's take a look at some special forces doing a room clearing drill. Very nice, could not have done it better myself. Keep in mind throughout the video that there are three fundamental principles that guide clearing a building according to the military field manual on Battle Drill 6 Alpha. The first one is to eliminate or capture all enemy forces within the building or have the enemy withdraw. The second rule is to prevent collateral damage depending on the ROE. The third rule is to maintain enough of a fighting ability to stop any counterattack from the enemy. And once you've successfully captured the building, you wanna make sure that you still have the ability to drive the enemy away. It's like my old platoon leader used to say, smash that objective. Okay, so clearing buildings in urban operations is honestly somewhat of a terrifying experience. I was a lowly enlisted 19 year old private the first time I went on a room clearing operation in Iraq. So I had no idea what to expect. It was like being part of an organized, synchronized chaos. 40 soldiers in the platoon ran into various buildings all at the same time. It's all been rehearsed a million times stateside, but that's nothing compared to actually seeing all of that training implemented. It's really impressive. It's the culmination of coordination between surveillance and intelligence, as well as GPS assets, ground troops, and multi-million dollar armored vehicles, all that coming together to, to hit an objective. After the mission, I realized there are a lot of misconceptions about exactly how these operations go down, especially for conventional forces. Urban missions are really interesting to me because it's one of the most recent standard operating procedures or battle drills added to the training manual. Many of the casualties from the past two decades came from room clearing, but out of those experiences, they started to create ways to overcome these challenges. Urban environments have historically always been a nightmare for armies to handle. So having a game plan going into the chaos is really important. Now here's the battle order. First thing that happens is your platoon sergeant gets the mission from the intelligence guy attached to your company. Basically the info will be something like, there's a no good baddie hiding out at this location in your area of operations. The intelligence NCO is either giving your platoon information that is based on human intelligence, that means people coming in and giving tips, or people being strongly asked for their cooperation. It could also have been intel recovered from a cell phone or gathered from hard drives captured during previous raids. We can go into more about how the army intelligence worked in Iraq in a future video if you're interested, let me know. When raiding an objective, you will be given all the mission details about who your platoon is tasked with capturing. What are they guilty of doing? Are they a high value target because they've been manufacturing bombs in your area of operations for years or because they ambushed friendly allied Iraqi police forces nearby? We have all the distinguishing features and possibly even a photo of the target at this point. The next step, is Redcon one time, it's go time. Everyone in the squad gets in their vehicle, whether it's a striker or an MRAP, it's usually about one in the morning or oh, 100 hours for all you military types out there. The HVT is hopefully laying their head to rest for the night, dreaming of whatever it is bad guys dream of. At this point, we've all successfully studied the maps prior to the attack. 
we will be given a satellite image with key information drawn onto it, including where everyone in the platoon would be located upon arriving at the objective. It's everyone's job to study the map and know their squad's mission and also the other squad's mission as well. This prevents friendly fire and it's key to successfully raiding an objective. So at this point, the vehicles reach the objective and they park in the pre-agreed spot to cordon off the area. So no vehicles can enter or leave while your platoon hits the building and finds that bad guy. The cordon element is often provided by another platoon. In this case, your platoon would park about 100 meters away from the objective at a setup zone. The vehicle set up 360 degree security, then each squad moves out on foot to the building that needs some rating. Note to all the hard charging infantry out there, don't get distracted by all the doors on the way to the objective. They might look shiny, they might look like they need kicking, but don't do it. Only kick the pre-approved doors. Each squad in a platoon will now do their predetermined role of either being the assaulting or overlook element. You might think everyone would want to do the more safe overlook role, but that would be to misunderstand the very refined culture of the infantry. Soldiers want that assaulting role. They want to prove that they have what it takes to be the number one in the stack kicking in the door. Three squads will assault an objective while one waits outside a distance away from the building to make sure there's no runners. Runners are the nickname given to an enemy trying to escape out the back door. Usually the Overwatch squad will be the heavy weapons squad with the 240 Bravo automatic machine gun. One fire team goes in front of the building and the other one in the rear. This way, if a squad starts taking fire while moving up to the building, then the support squad is ready in place, looking at the building and ready to give suppressing fire at the enemy to keep their heads down while that squad reaches the objective. There's an interesting quote on urban warfare. A US Army major in Vietnam said the following, it became necessary to destroy the town to save it, end quote. And that's kind of the paradox of urban warfare, isn't it? That you want to root the enemy out to potentially help the civilian population there, but in order to do that, you're going to destroy the place? The ROE, the rules of engagement, and philosophy of urban warfare have changed dramatically since then. We realized flattening a city might be counterproductive in the long run. The idea today is not to level cities. It might be more difficult on soldiers who are tasked with doing surgical room clearing, but it's also necessary to avoid making things worse for them in the grand scheme of things. My squad leader told me I got to be the number one guy in the stack because I was by far the most motivated and expendable guy in the entire squad. Huh? So why does the enemy always want to engage us in urban centers? It's because it gets rid of the Americans' advantage of tanks and close air support. Clear the room, violence of action. So the assault squad stacks up on the building behind the door exactly as you would in training. And the position directly next to the building is most safe because you're not exposed to any fire from the windows and you have your overwatch element protecting you. The point man in the fire team will check for booby traps and there are several kinds to watch out for, including pressure plates and trip wires. The number one or number three guy, depending on your squad SOP, will then kick in the door. In my old squad, we had the M249 saw gunner do the door kick, but first you should check out if the door is maybe already open and unlocked. I'm looking at you, second squad leader from my tour who tried kicking in an unlocked door multiple times before just turning the knob. If it's locked and kicking doesn't work, then you have your old Mossberg 500 shotgun to murder the door handle, or your fancy M26 if you're one of those new school infantry types. Many soldiers are sent to special training courses where they learn how to safely blow doors off their hinges using explosives that are secured to the outside of the door. In this case, you need to back away from the door to a safe distance and it has the added benefit of disorienting anyone inside the room. These breaching methods are all non-lethal to anyone inside the room. If you remember at the beginning of the video, one of those key tenets of room clearing is minimizing any unintended harm. The rules of engagement have changed over the years to reflect this because the military found they were creating far more problems for themselves by tearing every building down. 
The Army and Marine Corps infantry now do what's called surgical room clearing, which is what we're about to get into. So the squad enters the room and performs a task they've trained on a thousand times back in the States. Mount operations are the military's best practices and lessons learned from breaching and clearing a room. These procedures were improved by special forces after the Battle of Fallujah. It's meant to make the best of, honestly, a horrible situation. It's supposed to deal with the problem of the enemy having the huge advantage when soldiers walk into a room. Walking into a room puts you at a disadvantage because you're in the enemy's fatal funnel. The attacking squad has no idea where to look when entering a room initially and can only go one gun at a time. This method's main idea is to get as many troops into the room as quickly as possible and have them all covering different directions. You have to trust your squad to cover your blind spots. The principle at work here is called violence of action and soldiers are taught to aggressively get into the room as fast as humanly possible. Here's a more detailed breakdown of the drill, and I'll show you some footage of, the, of soldiers training on this exact method. The first guy enters the room and scans one corner of the room with the rifle up. They move towards their predetermined point of domination in the room, and they clear that sector of fire. They make sure there's no enemies there. They move in the direction of the path of least resistance. So depending on the layout of the room, they will move in that direction. You know, is the doorway in the center of the room or is the doorway on the corner of the room? Those things are gonna determine where that first guy goes. The second soldier in the stack enters the room in the opposite direction and makes sure no enemies are in that pied off area of the room. The third soldier checks the middle of the room and the fourth is usually the saw gunner who stays outside and maintains rear security in the hallway. But that depends on unit SOP. In our squad, the saw gunner did go in the room. The idea is to dominate each corner that you're pre-assigned and never stop moving to your sector of fire. Soldiers need to get as many guns in that room as quickly as possible, covering every angle in just a matter of seconds. Now you might be wondering why troops don't throw a flashbang in, and it's because conventional forces very rarely have access to a flashbang, and even if they did, they probably only end up blinding themselves more often than not, which I am almost 100% sure is exactly the cost-benefit analysis that the military ran before deciding to not make flashbangs standard issue. There are critiques of this standard operating room clearing procedure though. Far be it from me to suggest I could criticize those tactics because I was just a lowly enlisted grunt. So I'll defer to the experts. Brian Mack was a former infantry instructor and sniper NCO. He wrote a great article at defensepoliticsasia.com and in it, he points out some of the flaws in this method. For one, even if the first guy through the room sees an enemy to their front, they're not supposed to engage that enemy. The soldier is instead supposed to focus on their assigned corner. And a lot of military experts have a problem with charging in and ignoring that obvious threat. Brian Mack points out that this tactic was originally developed by highly trained special forces and it was meant to be paired with the use of flashbangs, which are typically only given to SF units. First of all, ouch, just because I wasn't SF doesn't mean I can't copy how they clear rooms. So if our way of clearing rooms isn't the best way, what's the solution? I don't wanna hear a bunch of complaining without solutions. Well, the British way of clearing rooms is one alternative, and they use a method called FIBU, which stands for Fighting in Built-Up Areas. No way. A military acronym without the word tactical in it? I can't believe that. Is this a prank? So, FIBU was popularized by the Israeli Defense Forces, and it entails methodically clearing rooms in a more slow way. You're meant to not just rush into the room and disregard threats. If you see an enemy in the room, you stop, and clear any threats before entering the room. The idea is kind of the exact opposite of the American philosophy of violence of action. You clear as much of the room as possible before even going in, and that's done by pieing off the corners. If you take fire, you use the door and the wall in the hallway as cover. This pretty much makes exact sense. Of course the USA is like, get in that room you what are you waiting for? Seriously though, after learning about this method, Personally, I think that the alternative British method for clearing rooms might be better. Some people think the Israeli method of room clearing is easier to learn, but I disagree with that. 
Honestly, it feels like it's more left open to interpretation if you have to choose between entering the room or not if you see an enemy inside. There are more variables, which means training and drilling on it over and over again would be harder, even if it is a better doctrine. Part of the reason why the American doctrine is so aggressive at this point is because we were specifically planning to go up against an enemy that wasn't that well trained or equipped. The idea is to win the fight before it even begins. This means showing up when the enemy least expect it in the middle of the night taking advantage of our we own the night capabilities. It means having strobe flashlights on and yelling at the enemy like you're a middle child with something to prove. It will be interesting to see if they make any changes to the training doctrine for rank and file infantry room clearing in the future. One of the reasons I say that is because we expect to be facing a better trained and better equipped near peer. The entire military is changing weapons, vehicles, and adjusting their training focus based on the near peers. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing an evolution in mount training really soon. China and Russia would also be very familiar with our old style of room clearing and would easily use that knowledge against us. Fortunately, there are new technological developments hitting the future infantry squad which are going to help out here. For instance, each squad will have access to an armed robot that can roll around and enter the room first. They'll also get a drone that they can look through windows with. I'm curious to know what you guys think though. Is the FIBU method or the USA mount version better? Let me know what you think in the comments. Once inside the building, the assaulting squad checks every person for a positive ID on the HVT. This is called the search phase. During this part, the squad will look for key pieces of information which could be useful. Intelligence gathering is really important. There could be maps or hard drives. This is called tactical site exploitation. Sometimes this information found on the objective can be more important than the high value target themselves. The squad will look around for weapon caches as well. After the building is clear, it's important to set up a 360 degree security in a foothold of the building. All doors must be covered and secured before the squad starts to leapfrog to other buildings. Some key priorities are maintaining suppressive fire on a building that you're engaged with. And once you have fire superiority, the platoon leadership will determine which squad moves ahead and which squad provides a base of fire. Once you have the building secured, another important thing that you can do is get a team up onto the rooftop to provide overwatch. You wanna be on the highest rooftop as possible, and you saw this a lot in Iraq. Large scale cities only started to become commonplace in like the last 300 years. Urbanization is increasing. Urban warfare is a relatively new military challenge, but it's only gonna grow. It's only going to become more frequent in the future as urban population centers continue to grow at a rapid pace all around the world. The ancient battles, like the ones that happened in the days of the Roman Empire, where they would lay siege to a city, and once the walls fell and the garrison soldiers surrendered, then the destruction of the city began. It was often customary back then to wipe entire cities and populations off the map after a successful siege. Urban warfare has always been a nightmare for the defending and attacking army. Some people might be surprised to learn there wasn't always a standard way the infantry practiced room clearing. The first clearing procedures were not really codified into military doctrine until the early 2000s, and it was a step-by-step -step evolution. Some foreign forces started creating the field manual after the Israeli-Lebanese war as early as 1982. Some of the first surgical room clearing operations were very prevalent during the Battle of Grozny in 2000. The Chechnya rebel forces were against the Russian forces there, and the Russian army realized they couldn't destroy every building without creating more and more rebel enemies. They needed to go house to house. Military raids on a building are designed to disrupt enemy movement. You don't want the enemy to feel like they're safe to conduct their operations with impunity. This procedure has become more front and center in war recently, with urban centers becoming more prevalent and frequently being of strategic importance. If you like this video, let me know. We can cover some more famous raids in modern military history. Please remember to subscribe to join the Spare Parts Army. We're a very underwhelming force, but at least you'll get notified when the next video comes out at the same time next week. Like and share the video because it tells the all-seeing, all-knowing YouTube algorithm 
to promote our videos to more people. I'm your host, Chris Cappy, and now for your moment of hua. Oh, <laughs> okay, three, two, eh. okay. <clears throat> that should have worked.